Welcome to Health Matters with Dr. Nelson Bulmash as he takes a fresh look at today's most interesting health topics with functional medicine's leading doctors and experts. Learn how to feed your mind, exercise your body, and nurture your spirit in the way nature intended. Catch him live every other Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Over the next hour, we'll introduce you to some fascinating people and engaging discussions that may provide you with answers to assist in revolutionizing your own personal health. And now, here's Dr. Nelson. Hey, everybody, Dr. Nelson Bullmash, the host of Health Matters on the UI Media Network. Today is December 21st, 2021, which means this is the last show of the year for us. I want you to know how much I love and appreciate you for watching my show, sharing my show, and getting my show out to more and more people. For those of you who have not seen Health Matters, it's dedicated to discussing the very, very best of health, inspiration, and spirituality. And today is no exception. As a chiropractor, naturopath, and nutritionist, I am here to bring up health topics, for example, with you that will hopefully compel you to think and to inspire you to take action so that you become healthier with the passing of each and every day because, yes, that's actually possible. So I have my very, very esteemed and wonderful friend, Dr. Suzanne Frey Turner, here to my left. She has better curls than me. It's just the way it worked out today. But she had a, she's had to have a, you had a professional help you, didn't you? Yeah. Not fair. Not fair. Revlon. Revlon. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, so we're here to have a great time and to educate you. And one of the things I want to do today is, and by the way, I have to say that, as I mentioned a moment ago, you're the only person who's ever been on my show three times. So thank you for that. That means thank a lot you. to me. I'm you're honored. so welcome. We're going to talk about what it was like personally and professionally for Dr. Turner to go through the novel pandemic, what it was like to have a disease that nobody had ever seen before, the likes of this, and how it impacted her life, as I mentioned, personally and professionally. So welcome to the show. It's great to have you here again. Thank you. So great to be here. Thank you. Let's jump right in. I want to hear what it was like to be on the front line of COVID and have to deal with it from a perspective of nobody knew what it was, where it came. I mean, there are some ideas about where it came from, but what was it like for you personally and professionally to show up at work one day and have this thing called COVID, a, a pandemic, worldwide event, in other words, that you really probably had pretty much no information on. And suddenly people expected you to be the expert in it and taking care of them and helping them and preventing them from, I'm guessing they would think, dying. Yes. It, this has been a very, it's been a very strange several months, 18, 19 now months right. that we've been doing with this. This started for me, my story starts, I think, back in February of 2020. So at that time, I was part of a mastermind group. We met together and discussed uh, the fact that this pandemic was coming. And at the time, I remember thinking, this is going to be nothing. Everyone's making a big fuss over nothing. And I, even saying that to some people and to my patients. And this mastermind, however, got together and said, Let's presume it's actually coming and what we're going to do, what are we going to do about it? Right. And so we made some plans and the mastermind group that I was part of, you guys have heard me before speak, I talk about peptides. And so the plan was at the time, we were going to use several um, things that would help to prevent people from getting sick. And so we had a whole plan of peptides plus other things to help patients from getting sick from this virus. And then a treatment protocol we came up with to try to treat this. So in my mind, the entire time, this was something that was approachable, that was treatable, that we needed to be taking care of patients from the very beginning. So so for me, although there was so little information out there, I at least felt armed with a little bit of, of some tools right. where I felt like I would be able to help patients. Now I say that, and even though that is true, there was a, I still had a lot of fear. But running a business and being the boss and owning the business and having a team of people who look to me for leadership, as well as patients right. and friends and colleagues who look to me for guidance. Um, uh, and one of the best things that came out of the pandemic is you and I becoming friends. Friends, right. And so uh, there were some great things that came out, but also the sort of heaviness of being the leader and, and being the responsible one when I didn't really feel like I had enough answers to give to anybody, yeah. myself included. So patients came and would ask questions. I wouldn't really have any the answers to give them. I would I was learning as fast as I could. 
you know, Google gives you a um, the opportunity to look uh, to set up alerts. So I was having them send me every single day every article that I could possibly find on this coronavirus pandemic and was studying, learning as fast <coughs> as I could. So hours a day spent researching. And still, of course, we only had whatever information that we had at the time. So based on that, we were treating patients. We did have some problems with our staff. So we, there were several of my staff members who were particularly afraid of the virus, and understandably, everyone was. Uh, and so there were several members of the staff who created more drama and more hype in the practice, and that was certainly a problem. Was that scary for you? It, it was only because I knew that it was affecting everyone else. Yeah. You know, I'm doing my best to try to keep everyone calm. You know, words, I wanted really, what one of the most important things to me was to continue to treat patients in our office. I remember one of the big concerns from this particular patient was, or this employee, was about doing nebulizer treatments in the office because she wasn't sure whether we'd be able to spread this by um, aerosolized. Of course, we mm -hmm. thought it was aerosolized mm -hmm. spread. And so she was very concerned about that and then how we were going to spend, how we were going to clean the rooms and how those sort of things. And in, it, it, instead of us working together as a team, we all sort of fell apart, which is really my responsibility as a leader, as a leader in this group. So um, it, it was a tough, it was a tough time for us. We never closed, you know, a lot of offices closed. and a lot of, a lot of yes. them are still closed and right. just now coming back yes. to um, work. So part of the reason why I talked to Nelson about doing this talk was thinking about, was hearing on the radio that a lot of people are going to start going back to work January 1st. And I thought, gosh, we've been open the whole Hold entire time. Yeah. There's never been a day that we were closed. Um, and we've been treating COVID patients in our office as a primary care to some degree mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for the last year. We've been treating COVID patients in our office. So that was that was a very interesting first year and in dealing with the staffing and, and trying to maintain my own anxiety. And at the time, because I had something I could do to treat, I wasn't aware of how fearful I was sure. about the about the actual pandemic. My husband spends hours and hours watching television. So he was aware of what was happening. I tried to just follow the um, Georgia does a great, I don't know where all of your listeners, the, around the country. Around the country. And so in Georgia, we have a, um, you can do this, you can see this graph and it's reported by all the labs in the in the state will report to this central um, place. And so yeah. we can actually watch how the numbers are going. And I think that was really calming for a lot of people. So I would pull that up on my computer and talk to patients about that. That was really nice to have. So that sort of was the first year, and then things started changing in the second year when we got the when the vaccination came out. Right. So, I want to ask you some hard questions, mm -hmm. and you trust me, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to come from you know a good place. But I, I love the way your mind works, and I want to really, I want to have an authentic conversation and get into the nitty gritty about how we're handling this now, how we did handle it, how we could have handled it better and maybe what we could do in the future. Because my father was a microbiologist, and one of the things that he taught me when I was about 15 years old, he pulled me aside one day, and he said, son, I'm gonna tell you something that's really scary. And I said, really, what, why are you gonna tell me that? <laughs> why do I need to hear that? And he didn't tell me exactly why, and later on I realized that he was privy to things like germ warfare studies. Mm -hmm. Like his friends were doing actual germ warfare studies on populations like Ottawa, Canada, San Francisco Bay Area, and this was this was actually all classified. And he said, please don't ever talk about this until I'm dead. But people died from these. And they used they used organisms that were supposedly inert, if you will, meaning benign. They wouldn't cause death, and yet they did. And they studied the patterns of transmission of these organisms. They would release it, uh, in, I think, in an aerosolized manner, and they would see how far it would go. And so he pulled me aside and he said, I want you to know that in your lifetime, you're going to deal with a pandemic. Mm. It's going to happen. And we had lots of conversations about it. And he was so brilliant. He gave me some real good insight and helped calm me going through this. It must have been harrowing for you at times because there were times it was scary. There were a lot of people dying from this. Mm -hmm. This was no joke. So I want to talk to you about a gentleman by the name of Peter McCullough. Mm -hmm. who's an interventional cardiologist, he's an epidemiologist, and he's an internist. And I think you'd agree with me, he's a very credible guy. He's very. written 
over 650 medical peer-reviewed articles. Yes, I believe the largest uh, of anyone of, in his particular area. area. Of study. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So you agree with me, he's quite a credible man. Absolutely. And he, he talked about four pillars of treatment for COVID. Mm -hmm. The first of which is how to reduce the spread of infection. Mm -hmm. Let's, can we, do you mind if we talk about that for a Absolutely. second? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things, Suzanne, would you do to help limit the spread of infection? So probably the best thing would be if we could figure out who the people are that have it and people mm -hmm. would stop saying, oh, it's just allergies because that's really what it looks like at the very beginning right. and start realizing that these are symptoms that we need to be aware of and staying home if you have symptoms that are concerning or at least getting tested quickly if you have symptoms that are concerning. The second thing that we know is helpful is um, using some sort of either betadine or peroxide in a diluted solution and using that into the nasal and um, oral passages. Yeah. In fact, we believe that this is more effectual than the masks are at this point. So with the virus is actually one micron in diameter and the masks are th uh, only protect three microns yeah. in diameter. And so we really believe that the based on the most recent research, that if you are daily at the end of your exposure to whatever your world is, um, rinsing out your nose and mouth, your nasal passages, because that's where the virus comes into your body uh, with this either betadine or peroxide diluted solution. Right. It's usually a 1% solution. Um, then you can keep this from being a problem. Um, the company Betadine makes a, a sore throat gargle that is a 0.5% solution. That would work. Um, yeah, it's, it's remarkable, Suzanne, how effective that was. I heard the statistics. It's very impressive. And it was mm -hmm. remarkable how much it lowered the viral load mm -hmm. with with one one cleansing, if you will. Right. So that might be something that people could even do every day if they're out and about in the world. Well, and keep in mind, we're not just treating COVID. I mean, we still are right now. One of the big things I'm seeing is a virus called metanumovirus. Um, we're also seeing some flu come out. So this is a treatment that will be effectual for all of those viruses, yeah, very not good point. just treating COVID. I mean, all those things are going on right now. Yeah, my son said that they were having as many people with uh, respiratory syncytial virus as they were yes, with, with COVID RSV, and, exactly. RSV in, in uh, Mississippi. Exactly. Yeah, I remember having this conversation weeks ago. He said, you know, Dad, this is crazy. We're having more trouble with that than COVID. Now, exactly. it, it's probably going back and forth some, but... But thank you for that, Suzanne. Your point is really well taken. One of the things that everybody keeps doing is focusing on the fact that we just have COVID. And I'm actually finding a lot of people are suddenly ill with other diseases for it, the first time. It is true. And yeah. one of the things that we do in our office to try to, to mitigate that confusion is we do a test that PCR tests for several different mm -hmm. um, strains. So not only bacteria, but, but viruses, including COVID, but several different viruses as well. So when you come in with symptoms that sort of sound a little COVID-like, right. then we can actually test you not only for COVID, that test comes back pretty quickly, but the rest of the panel takes about 48 hours. So then we can say, well, you're, it's not COVID, but you have so-and-so. Um, and I've actually picked up a few coronavirus that's not COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. That's the original cold virus. Nice. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Real quickly, is I've heard it said that the Omicron is more akin to a very severe cold than as severe as the Delta variant. Do you have a comment on that? Right. So the the transmissibility is actually less than the Delta variant, not mm -hmm. by a tremendous lot, but slightly less right. um, than the tr than the Delta variant. Uh, and most of the cases so far are not illness cases, severe illness cases. Mm -hmm. They are more like a flu, four or five days, six days of upper respiratory symptoms, and then those symptoms resolve. Very good. All right, folks, I'm Dr. Nelson Bullmesh. You're listening to the last episode of Health Matters on the UI Media Network for this year, the year 2021. It's been an exciting year, a lot of events. I have my very dear friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Suzanne Turner, and we're talking about her life dealing with the pandemic as a physician on the front line of COVID. And now we're going to begin to explore what nobody really has talked about which is some of the things you can do to prevent yourself so that should you get sick over the next year or years to come, because I believe that this virus is going to be in our, in our system, in our society, in our culture for years to come. You can protect yourself. We're going to talk about much of that in the next 45 minutes. We'll be right back.
safety air purification systems. An air purifier with robust technologies that can filter, sterilize, and re-energize large quantities of air at a whisper quiet volume. It features a proprietary HEPA RX and pre-filter that act as a capturing layer going for big particles and ultra-fine particles. Its next layer is an activated carbon filter that absorbs and captures volatile organic compounds and noxious odors. From viruses to bacteria, its kill chamber packs a three-punch layer to destroy over 99% of anything that remains in the air. And while most air purifiers stop at the capture or kill stage, Safety Air Purifier takes it one step further, re-energizing clean, pure, sterilized air by creating negative ions within the revitalizing chamber. The Safety Air Purifier also monitors air quality in real time, utilizing smart sensor technology that helps you breathe better air, increase productivity, and improve morale. But don't just take our word for it. Ask the thousands of workplaces we've helped, Fortune 500 companies, dental offices, senior facilities, K-12 schools and universities, and professional sports teams. The Safety Air Purifier's robust technology combined to protect you against indoor air pollutants and viruses to make the most powerful yet quietest air purifier. Safety Air Purification. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Nelson Bullmash. You're listening to another edition, the last edition of Health Matters for the year 2021. Thank you for joining us. Once again, if you like the information that I present and the incredible guests like Dr. Suzanne Frey Turner, please share the show. My goal is to get out to as many people in the world as possible. And it's interesting because you never know who's listening to your show. I've had women from Pakistan and India and China contact me about my show. So never feel like what you do isn't heard or appreciated. It just may be more than you realize. So we're talking about a number of things. We're talking about Dr. Turner uh, living through, as we all have, the pandemic and how it impacted her life personally and professionally. Now we're talking about some of the things that nobody's talking about, meaning, in other words, that it, it would appear that the only thing you can do to protect yourself is to be vaccinated. And unfortunately, this is not true. And I want to have a very authentic conversation, a a deep, meaningful, purposeful conversation with Dr. Turner about this, because so many people still don't know, for example, that you should make sure you have your vitamin D3 levels checked. And that's only one nutrient, right? The body requires a symphony of nutrients to make sure that your immune system is in check. And when we're healthy, when we take great care of ourselves, when we eat well, when we get the sleep we need, when we manage our stress, when we exercise, when we get outside and are active... We have immune systems that are much, much stronger. And so the people who are going through the pandemic and getting COVID, who are very robust with regard to their health and their immune competence, are doing very, very well. The people who are not doing well are people who have compromised health and people who have compromised health perhaps greatly because they haven't attended to the needs of their health and well-being for many years. Suzanne, let's jump right into this again. Let's go into point two, pillar two. Dr. Peter McCullough's Four Pillars of Health. Mm -hmm. And that is, he speaks about early treatment. What are some of the novel things that perhaps you do uh, at your office or that you advocate that make a big difference in helping people weather the storm of COVID? I love that you mentioned the uh, vitamin D levels, getting those checked early. I think there's a few other things that are helpful to be sure you know this ahead of time. And because there are things that you can intervene on. So I really uh, like the vitamin D level. And the goal for that is for your vitamin D level to be between 60 and 80. That's different than what it might say on your lab test report where it says normal because normal is not optimal. And the optimal level, we know that from research that patients whose whose vitamin D levels are higher when they catch COVID Mm -hmm are less susceptible to illness, regardless of their severe illness, regardless of their uh, comorbidities. And so again, that goal is between 60 and 80 for vitamin D. We also know that for patients who have an albumin, which is part of a typical complete metabolic panel that people order, uh, complete metabolic panel will show your albumin level. For an albumin that's greater than 4.5, That's where we also see greater, better outcomes for COVID patients. And then an alkaline phosphatase level, less than 60. 
There are things you can do to intervene on those things. One is uh, with the albumin, you can do increased resistance training, um, for th- and you can increase your protein intake. Right. For your alkaline phosphatase being high, there are a few things that need to happen, but a lot of times this is a marker of intestinal inflammation. And so working on your intestinal microbiome, we know that this is a big part of what happens in COVID, that a lot of the inflammatory storm or cytokine storm that you've probably heard of in the past actually comes from that Mm -hmm. intestinal dysbiosis that's going on. And alkaline phosphatase may be an early sign of that being disrupted. The other thing that's important is if you do have particularly the comorbidity of diabetes, being on a medication like metformin may actually be, which is one of the most common drugs that's used to treat diabetes, may actually be harmful in your in your treatment for covid. So if you're on metformin when you get covid, there are a few research studies that show that that can be detrimental. So one of the things that people are suggesting there's a whole category of drugs out there called GLP1s. These are a, a hormone that's naturally made by your intestines in response to a meal. These are available synthetically through many uh, pharmacies, right. through, through many pharmaceutical companies. Several different ones make them. And there's some evidence that being on one of those, rather than being on metformin, at the time of diagnosis, improves your outcome with COVID should you catch it while you're um, take while you have diabetes. Beautiful. This, I believe, is also true with some of the blood pressure medications as well, right? You're exactly right. So if you have blood pressure, one mm-hmm. of the medication, one of the things that we started doing from the beginning is when we would see our patients, we would switch them over to an um, ACE inhibitor or particularly an ARB, which is, a, there are several drugs in that category. Mm-hmm. We know that the virus binds to this ACE2 receptor and that we think that there's, there was, there's some evidence that being on an ARB when you catch COVID does improve improve your risk of developing severe illness. So that's another thing that we switch, we'll switch do with patients. Of course, we're encouraging patients to um, manage their anxiety because the number four comorbidity that's associated with um, developing severe illness from COVID, number one is obesity, number two is diabetes, number three is hypertension, number four is anxiety. I did not know that. Wow. And, and so treating patients with anxiety, um, getting patients to begin to do meditation or mindfulness practices right. before they're exposed to COVID is probably one of the better ways to go. This past weekend, I learned about a new app. It's Unwinding Anxiety, the app, and um, very good. I've started to to try to use it myself Mm -hmm, to see mm -hmm. um, how it would be for my patients. And so there are lots of opportunities for us to to get those things under control. Um, You could use it. There's a free app called um, Insight Timer. That's a meditation app. Uh, There's one called Calm. Calm. Love Mm -hmm. Calm. Do you have any others that you like? Calm is one I typically use, Mm -hmm. Suzanne. I love Mm -hmm. that one. Mm -hmm. And I put it on every night before I go to sleep. Oh, nice. And Mm -hmm. I keep my phone a distance. I know some of you are going to be like, Nelson, what are you doing? EMF. Come on. But I put it several feet away and I listen to programs that last for eight or 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And I, so I wake up in the middle of the night and I, I feel very calm. Right. Yeah. Those are great. So it's curious to me, Suzanne, I was listening to a podcast with uh, Rogan and Peter McCullough, and one of the things that they discussed was none of these major institutions, not Harvard, not Yale, not Stanford, not Michigan, not Vanderbilt, had any early treatments, nor did they have any treatments that everybody agreed on collectively for the third point, which is to improve hospital treatments. That seems crazy to me. Well, what's so interesting is there is a study out there that shows that any pre-hospital treatment, Mm -hmm. any pre-hospital treatment improves hospital outcomes. Right. So for us to, as providers of care, Mm -hmm. to send patients home, even last week, my daughter, who is uh, pregnant at 12 weeks. Congratulations. Thank you. Very exciting. Number six grandchild for us. Wow. Wow. she called her primary care to tell him that she had upper respiratory symptoms while she's 12 weeks pregnant. Wow. Uh, so her OBGYN's not really seeing her yet because she's so early. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was very concerned about her upper respiratory symptoms. And her, her um, primary care told her he would not see her unless she had a negative COVID test. And I thought, wow. here we are 19 months in. Right. There are study after study after study on things we can do zinc, vitamin D, quercetin, to protect ourselves and then to treat COVID, so many therapies available to treat Mm -hmm. this, Mm -hmm. that how can you 
I just can't understand how can you not right. treat them with something ahead of time, especially since most of the drugs and therapies that we're using now are proven for other reasons. So they've been tested in humans, repurposing them now as medications to treat um, COVID. So it's it's very frustrating to me that that's still existing, even this late in the game, even when there's there's large groups like the FLCCC, like Dr. McCullough has a, pro, a protocol that he uses. There's several other great, um, the um, American, I think it's the American Academy of Physicians and Surgeons that's out. They, they have a protocol. And so ha, with all these protocols, why have none of the universities come out with their yes, protocol? protocols? And that was Peter McCullough's point. Like, how can we have these brilliant minds at Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Michigan None of them have protocols. Yes. It, it says a number of very interesting things to me, Suzanne. One is that we have become overly laden with the notion that we can only have health through medication, through drugs mm-hmm. and vaccines. Now, I'm not opposed to drugs or vaccines in the right circumstances. What, I'm, what is alarming to me is that we've gotten so far away from the notion of health that we think that the and I've I've heard doctors say well the, the only way you can get through this is through drugs and medication you know drugs and uh, like the vaccines and some of the new orals that they're coming out with which I don't know a whole lot about I don't know if you do or not but that's really alarming to me mm-hmm. there's a I want to be very careful how I say this I'll just leave it at this there's a professor over at Life University who said for example and I know the studies are small that getting adjusted can improve immune mm. outcomes. Mm-hmm. And I believe that. It's one of the first things I always do, because I know that when I get adjusted, I feel better. My immune system gets stronger. I tend to get through things much more readily. That's my humble experience over 35 years, actually over longer, because I started when I was 15, but going through school and then becoming a licensed professional. So it's so interesting to me that we've gotten so far away from what real health is. Well, and the other thing that you do is resistance training. To yes, I do. Your, to improve your immune system. I would think anything that would think about attacking me, given what my bench press is, would be alarming and intimidating in and of itself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, I'm being a little silly there, but it bring a little humor to it. So are there, uh, I mean, do you have any comments? Are there any drugs that you think have efficacy in their use during this period? So in our practice, we treat our COVID patients with uh, as early as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, that may even include preventive therapy with there's, with ivermectin and or nidazoxanide. Um, ivermectin is an, a drug that's been in use for many years. It won the Nobel Prize for its efficacy in treating um, cases of parasites. It has over 60 studies demonstrating its benefit against COVID. 30 of those are randomized trials. So with a a drug that's been around since the 1940s with years and years of safety data in humans that we know from a number of studies, uh, we're not going to have a perfect study anytime soon for no no thing. Of course. Everything is experimental right now. Right. But we have 60 studies, 30 of them are randomized uh, trials showing efficacy. I think it's probably one of the better therapies, and it's one of our first line. There was one study that showed that using it prophylactically on a weekly basis Mm -hmm. and a weight-based dose, not in the horse dose, but in the weight-based dose that's um, that's specified by your doctor, uh, that that is protective against um, COVID, that 86% decrease in the risk of developing severe infection. So with the claims by the um, vaccination companies that uh, that they have... Um, 90%, I think we're coming pretty close to that with using a preventive therapy like ivermectin. So I just have to ask you, and I know you can smile at me and say, oh, you're silly, Nelson, and that's fine. Why are they, why are they not allowing drugs like ivermectin to be used routinely? Because there's a huge push I mean, we, uh, to slap I can't... your wrist if you use ivermectin as a practicing physician. Yes, I can't get, um, none of the pharmacies will fill it for my patients. I have to get it from a compounding pharmacy. Um, it's, it's very difficult. How does it make you feel, Suzanne, to know that as a physician, as someone, I mean, you're, you're very regarded. You worked at, uh, is it okay if I say what you worked at Emory University, you, which is a very prestigious hospital here in Atlanta, Georgia. I was on faculty for 17 years. I know. I was just going to mention that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's Se- amazing. Seven years, seven years. Yeah. So 
how does it make you feel as an incredible physician who you would think you pay big dollars to, to come up with brilliant ideas, like some of the ones you've shared, and not be able to ever actually carry those out with your patients? I'm going to ask answer that after the break. Oh, okay. Do we have a break? We do. All right. It looks like my guest is more on her game than I am. Sorry, I, I, this is a very compelling conversation with a very dear friend of mine. Folks, Dr. Nelson Bullmash will be right back. Don't you touch that dial. If this content resonates with you, don't forget to subscribe to our channel at uimedianetwork.org to stay updated with our uncensored shows. Also, like and follow us at UI Media Network on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and almost all your favorite podcasting platforms. Most importantly, if you're being censored on social media, write to us at contact at uimedianetwork.org to get your message out. And remember, keep raising that frequency. All right. My guest is keeping me on course today, which is no surprise. As I told you, she's amazing. Please continue, Suzanne. Do you remember where you were? You tell me again. All right. So I I just have to ask you, as, a, as an incredible professional, somebody who's really good at what you do, and that's one of the reasons that I chose you, is because before I even met you, I kept hearing people say, Dr. Turner, you got to see Dr. Turner, got to see Dr. Turner. It's like, okay, fine. I'll see her. And then we, you know, we met, which was wonderful. And you are my personal physician. My question is, how does it make you feel to be such an esteemed physician with great ideas, tremendous competency, and you can't use the very tools that would help you get people better? It's it's both scary because, uh, you know, you hear about the attacks that are coming from social media, from wherever, on and maybe even from from the medical boards on physicians. But I have to remember that that the goal for treating patients is to get them better. This is what we do. Right. This is what, what I talked to my staff in the very beginning. We are here to treat patients. And, and I want to make sure that that's, that's our priority. Even if it puts me at risk, even if I end up getting COVID because I'm treating COVID patients, it's worth it to me because that's what I signed up for. That's what we all signed up for when we agreed to do this. So, yes, it's fearful. I'm, I'm afraid I'm responsible for my office staff. I'm responsible for for the put them helping put them food on the table. Um, but I also and, and my own table, of course. But I also feel a real strong responsibility to take care of them and um, to take care of patients. And so, if I have something that might work, rather than sending you home and saying see you when you get over COVID, hope you do, I, I feel like it, I really compelled. It's super important that I go ahead and treat patients. So. Well, I, I really appreciate that about you because, as I mentioned, a lot of the physicians, a lot of the chiropractors I know, said I'm shutting down. I'm not. I don't want to be part of this. I'm mm -hmm. too afraid. I get it. I appreciate that. I yeah. was fearful too. Of course, and you faced your fear, and that's very noble. You know, I don't think I realized how fearful I was until after I caught COVID. So January comes around, the vaccines start coming mm -hmm, out, mm -hmm. they were in short supply, and so I thought, you know, I go to the gym very often, I'm very healthy, I eat right, I probably have a strong enough immune system, I was doing a lot of preventive therapies at the time, a lot of peptides, um, and... I felt like I did not need a vaccine at the time, so I was going to give right. my vaccine to someone else. So I just thought I would wait, and I mm -hmm. kind of waited, and then I got really busy, and so I just kept waiting. And then um, I caught COVID, and I didn't catch it from anyone in my office, even though I took care of COVID patients most days in my office. Um, my nurse, or one of the staff in my office, right. drives for a lift, and I, we think she caught it um, that uh, I'm not sure. Working. We don't know where, where we got it. But she was the first one in the office to catch it. So that's got where it. we presume. And then uh, we, we, and we sit at lunch with each other. So then what I didn't realize, I don't think I was aware of how afraid mm -hmm. I was and how until after I finished being sick with COVID, which was three or four days, when I finished being sick with COVID, all of a sudden I was like, <sighs> whoa, I can actually take a deep breath, breath again. And it wasn't about COVID deep breath. It was, I am so relieved yeah, that you lived through be, it. That I lived through it. Through it. And yeah. I didn't realize how afraid I was sure. until at, until that point. So that was, that was a, a, a really interesting point for me to realize yeah. how scared I was 
ahead of time, but I'd sort of been holding it together for everyone else in my life, for our daughters and our grandkids right. and and for, for my husband and for my family and for the patients. It's a very scary disease. Uh, I had it and I had it in 2019 when nobody knew what it was uh, before I started seeing you. And every doctor I saw would look at me and say, Nelson, you got something. I don't know what it is. And they would label me as having uh, ad- acute adult onset idiopathic asthma. I said, well, that's a fabulous label. Can we go anywhere with that? No, not at all. <laughs> okay, thanks for your time. So it, it is scary. And I remember going through moments, Suzanne, where like I had people from back home say, Nelson, I want you to know these four people from the gym died. Mm. And they were people of color. And when four of them were people of color, and these were not people who were living in poor conditions, mm. I thought, Mm, we got a vitamin D3 problem. That was the first thing that came to mind. And I started finding a definite relationship, Suzanne, with people who had, when I say, I shouldn't say adequate, ideal levels of vitamin D3, the outcomes were very different, which painted a picture for me, which made me realize that if vitamin D3 is critical, we know it is for activating a proper immune response, that so are the litany of other tools that we have, meaning the elements that create the symphony of nutrients that allow us to have an effective immune response. Exactly. Yeah. So let's go to point uh, point three here. Is there anything you want to touch on? McCullough's third point here is improving hospital treatment. Any comments you want to make about that? Well, one of the things I think is most important is I, I do think that there's some be- eff- efficacy for using the monoclonal antibodies. I do think there's some evidence of benefit there. There are some interesting researchers out of San Francisco right now right. who are helping you to create your own antibodies in your own your own without having to be exposed to the virus. So forgive me, my details are not perfect, but it's in a research uh a study right now in an IRB, they're actually taking the blood, exposing it to COVID, and then putting the ant, giving you the antibodies back. So fascinating work that wow. is being done by a dear colleague, friend of mine out in California. And, um, and that's exciting because there's lots of ways we're seeing that these antibodies, if we can give people either their own antibodies or someone else's antibodies, that they can actually um, do well. So with exposure or with um, with the first several days of illness, right. that's when the time is the best. All of this, remember, there's several stages of this disease. The first probably three to six days of this illness mm-hmm. are the treatment or the time when your body is actually fighting the virus. Once we get past day five, six, seven, now we're talking about the cytokine storm. And this is where we start seeing that very severe hospitalization and illness that occurs. And, and also the things like myocarditis that you mentioned before. And so the the we have to realize we're, that the treatment strategy is different. And this is kind of newer information you know, right. in the last several months. That we're the treatment strategy is different from the beginning where we're fighting the virus to the middle where we're trying to keep patients from developing a high response to the a, a cytokine storm response or a chemical messenger response to this to the COVID virus, and then in some patients and it's in it's not so many but some patients they mm-hmm. develop especially with the comorbidities we discussed they develop this high response that's very difficult to control it's sort of auto amplified by your own immune system right. and so it it's, it's very similar to what we see in an autoimmune patients where they kind of amplify their own response to this um, to the antibody Bodies. so we in, in creating that so my point is to merely to say early treatment with the with the um, antibodies is also really good once you've gone past that original f- stage where you're no longer treating the virus you're now treating the cytokine storm now those aren't so helpful anymore so the earlier you can get in the earlier you can get tested this is one of the reasons it's so frustrating to me because Patients will have symptoms for two days, then they mm-hmm. will call their doctor, their doctor will say, get a test, the test takes two more days. So now they're day four before they even get treated. And so one of the things we do with our patients is give them prophylactic or at least uh, preventive um, something, preventive, mm-hmm. I- ivermectin or nidazoxide or hydroxychloroquine. Um, the studies that came out showing that it was ineffectual um, were actually studies that were given too late in the treatment course. And so when you give these therapies early enough in the treatment course, we actually have really good outcomes. And it really needs to be a combination of therapies to make them better. Thank you for saying that, because I think we live in a time where people look for magic bullets. Mm -hmm. And in my world, there is no such thing as a magic bullet. 
for example, you talk about how you treat somebody with COVID, that to me is different than handling the cytokine storm. I, for example, have used liposomal glutathione, curcumin, and vitamin C very, very effectively. Mm -hmm. Yes. And had people uh, sometimes as little as four to 12 hours say, Nelson, I don't know what, I can breathe normally again. Yes. Now, I'm not treating the disease per se. I'm helping to modulate the person's immune response And these people will often start breathing very normally again. And all of that depends on when in the treatment course. So what's critical for me to know when you come to see me is what day of symptoms are you? Where are we in this treatment course? Am I fighting a virus? Am I protecting you from the onset of this cytokine storm? Or am I treating the cytokine storm? And so if you're giving things in the wrong, we want a high level of of, of oxidants, of reactive oxygen species during the phase where we have the virus. This is when we want the the highest level of reactive oxygen species. We don't want to be using um, antioxidants then. We want to start using the antioxidants as the patient starts to get better and then hopefully preventing them from getting this huge cytokine storm. So several days into it, maybe day day five, day six, maybe? I would say three, four. Oh, Mm -hmm. three, four. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That early. Got it. Got it. So let's talk the big V word, vaccination. Mm -hmm. And I know this is controversial. You take it wherever you feel comfortable. Peter McCullough talks about, he, he believes very strongly in vaccinations. What's your opinion on it? On the idea of, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you think that everybody needs to be vaccinated? I do not think everybody needs to be vaccinated. Um, I have several patients who I feel probably needed to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Um, Several with lots of comorbidities who were unable to make changes in their life for whatever reasons. Um, I think those patients definitely needed to be vaccinated. I think that, you know, I had an 80-year-old lady who uh, had uh, COPD, which is a emphysema, a version of emphysema. She lived in an assisted living facility and was so afraid of this virus that she would not come out and see her family. Right. And she was so anxious about it and and believed that the, that the vaccine was going to help her. So she got a vaccine. I think that was the perfect situation because number one, it got her back out socializing with other people mm-hmm. in the facility. It got her back out socializing with her family. And so, and so it lowered her anxiety. This decreased her risk of infection. Right. Now, she is in the age group that is at the highest risk for side effects from the vaccine. So that's a little bit of a tough call. But I think for that person, I think that was the right thing. At the beginning, when it first came out, my question, when people would ask me, do I need a vaccine? I would say, what is not getting the vaccine preventing you from doing? And if they had something that it was preventing them from doing, then I would say, I, I think that's important. If you can't see your grandchildren because your daughter won't let you because then, okay, I think that's a reasonable reason to get it. If you um, are, if you have certain conditions and you are unable to make changes in your life because of that, I think there's reasons to get it. Why do you think, Suzanne, some people react so fiercely to it and others seem to have no reaction? I spoke to people who said, I didn't have any trouble going through it at all. Absolutely. And then I spoke to people, got it? who literally said, uh, I spoke to a number of people, I was shocked, who said, my husband got it and in 24 hours he was dead. Mm-hmm. That can't be coincidental. Right. I know McCullough talks about that too, that, uh, matter of fact, I have the statistics here where he gives uh, how 80, 80% of the people who die, die in the first week of side effects from the vaccine and 50% of those in the first 48 hours. My only patient to die died... Um, within two weeks after get, she had, she had, um, she was 73. So she had a risk factor mm-hmm. for sure. She also had um, pulmonary sarcoid. So she was at risk factor, but she got the vaccine on day three of symptoms. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I, I certainly can't hundred percent attribute that, but it sure is coincidental. And sure she's my only patient who died. I'm sorry. It's it was rough. very hard. She was very special. Absolutely. All right, folks. We will now take our third commercial break. Doesn't this go fast, Susan? So fast. It's incredible. Always. We need a four-hour show. We just need to do dinner and a movie and, and a show. Have all of our friends come in and, like, you know, have a, have a be on a stage somewhere. We're going to do that one of these days. All right, folks. We'll be right back, and we'll finish with our last segment of Health Matters. Safety Air Purification Systems 
an air purifier with robust technologies that can filter, sterilize, and re-energize large quantities of air at a whisper quiet volume. It features a proprietary HEPA RX and pre-filter that act as a capturing layer going for big particles and ultra-fine particles. Its next layer is an activated carbon filter that absorbs and captures volatile organic compounds and noxious odors. From viruses to bacteria, its kill chamber packs a three-punch layer to destroy over 99% of anything that remains in the air. And while most air purifiers stop at the capture or kill stage, Safety Air Purifier takes it one step further, re-energizing clean, pure, sterilized air by creating negative ions within the revitalizing chamber. The Safety Air Purifier also monitors air quality in real time, utilizing smart sensor technology that helps you breathe better air, increase productivity, and improve morale. But don't just take our word for it. Ask the thousands of workplaces we've helped Fortune 500 companies, dental offices, senior facilities, K-12 schools and universities, and professional sports teams. The Safety Air Purifier's robust technology combined to protect you against indoor air pollutants and viruses to make the most powerful yet quietest air purifier. Safety Air Purification. We're back for the last segment of Health Matters in the year 2021. I can't believe I'm saying that, but Christmas is this Saturday. Mm. I hope all of you are ready. I know I am. I'm a jolly fellow and I can't wait. (laughs) They're laughing at me. It's okay, laugh. It's okay. All right, Suzanne, let's jump back in. And uh, you were talking about the efficacy of using the vaccine for certain people. It's interesting, the notion that you can create such a response by the body to the to the spike protein that you can you can have such severe damage like the soccer players in Europe they're really having a problem with this and they're very upset with it it's really a concern and and the, it sort of goes to this is why we need to think about who is the person not only the person in general at age 20 for example we want to think about who is that particular like I want to think about who is Nelson Womash right and what does this mm-hmm. person need to get a vaccine? What is his what is his vitamin D level? What is his albumin level? What is his alpha-fos level? What is his general in life? What has the last five years been of his response to, to viruses in general? What it, it, I have to look at each individual person and say, do you need a vaccine or do you not? The, this was really difficult. One of the biggest concerns for me is um, the the introduction of the virus so early in the pandemic. I do think it's uh, it's certainly been helpful, but it, I think there's some ba- some side effects that we need to be concerned about, and and, st- and I think that we're not going to know the outcome of those of this the degree of side effects, um, and for many years to come, unfortunately. Well, and I I'll probably get shot down for this, but McCullough, I wrote this down. He talks about 45,000 deaths are believed to have been caused by the vaccination. He said that. I'm just repeating what he said. Remember, he's one of the leading authorities in the world in interventional cardiology, epidemiology, and internal medicine. But let's say it's 10,000. That's, that's a huge let's number. Let's say it's 5,000. Yeah, that's a, that's a big number. How come we aren't hearing about it? That's a little bit concerning. And, and I, you know, I have, I have a patient who was, a, one patient who was hospitalized for three days with an allergic reaction to the vaccine. So she's the only patient that I've really had other than pretty significant um, um, localized or flu-like symptoms, uh, particularly after the third booster. Right. Mm-hmm. I do want to make a comment, Suzanne, and that is that I haven't had any severe, had one person had an allergic reaction to the vaccine and she was stabilized with Benadryl, spent time in the hospital, they got her all cleared up. Interestingly, when they checked her, her antibody response was the highest I've seen out of anybody. Mm-hmm. She had a very good antibody response and went through COVID without much difficulty when she did get it. I want people to know that getting yourself in order, living a healthy life, reducing your weight, your blood pressure, getting active, taking high quality supplements, being under the care of someone like you or someone like me, is really important to your outcomes. Absolutely. And I want people to understand this because here's the thing. I've met so many people who think the only way through this is to be vaccinated or take one of the new oral drugs that they have to help beat COVID. We're always, throughout our lives, going to have this organism or another organism that we're going to have to contend with. Ultimately, 
I would humbly suggest that one of the best things in the world you could do is take incredible care of yourself, that there is no price too big to be paid for that. Meaning you're, you're, you're not, you know, we have a saying in nutrition, you're never going to uh, out train, for example, a bad diet. You're not going to get through a pandemic without taking great care of yourself. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts about that? I agree with you. One one of the other things that I thought was really important that we talk about here mm-hmm. was the outcome for my business based on the pandemic. Right. And um, because I had COVID, went through, mm-hmm. survived, have antibodies, hallelujah, um, the research now is coming out. There's probably now 35 or 40 studies demonstrating at least as uh, as good an outcome with with COVID antibodies as to vaccine exposure, and probably better. There's some more recent research right. that's demonstrating probably better with natural immunity than with the vaccine. And so when the company who holds my um, insurance contracts, um, because we have been taking insurance this year, the company who holds my insurance contracts came to us and said, uh, we are going to mandate vaccines for everyone uh, they required me to get a vaccine. And I said, there's actually three studies out now that demonstrate an, an increased risk of side effects if you have natural immunity and you get a vaccine. And so because of that and because of my our, my um, research around natural immunity in general, I decided not to get a vaccine. And so because of that decision, that, that has meant that we've had some big changes in my practice. Um, I have lost all of my insurance contracts and I will now be t- uh, doing no insurance practice. So it's a big change wow. for my business. Yes, it is. Um, we'll see how that all settles down. I know there were lots of patients we were really disappointed and sad to have to lose us and and to lose the ability to see us because they wanted to continue to use their insurance. This has actually been something we've probably been planning for several years, mm-hmm. but the timeline was moved up real, a lot earlier than we were ready for. So because of this uh, short timeline that we had, a lot of people were surprised and and disappointed and and felt as though we didn't give them enough notice. So it's really affected our business quite a bit. And that's fine. We're going to be resilient and like a phoenix you will. flying. You um, know, Suzanne, I, I want to speak to that for a moment. We, we had something similar happen. We were uh, involved several years ago. We just had uh, the CEO of United Healthcare started doing post-payment audits. Great way to make lots of money. And that was his genius. Interestingly, he was also caught eventually doing some things and was forced to step down as a CEO and then politely asked for a 1.2 to $1.4 billion severance package. Pretty interesting. Uh, not the point, but just interesting how, like, who would claim, uh, who would suggest a, a 1.2 to $1.4 billion severance package? Because what that translates to is that people don't get the care they need because they can't afford it. So the interesting thing is we were caught in that. And because we kept having these post-payment audits, and I made through all of them, but it was too stressful. Like, who wants to be audited? That's a terrible experience. And so we they quit are. quit doing insurance. And overnight, we lost 50% of our patients. 70% of them came back within three years. I looked at them and I said, why'd you come back? Mm-hmm. And they said, because we couldn't find anybody that could do what you did. And you'll be in the same position. They'll come back. Mm-hmm. They're upset. They aren't getting their way. It's hard not to you know have insurance covered initially. But here's the neat thing. What we found with our patients was... They paid for their care on a credit card, and most of them said in three or four weeks they got their reimbursement. Mm -hmm. You'll do fine. You're a very, very good, highly skilled doctor. Thank you. So what what point would you like? I mean, you know, we've got a few more minutes. Is there anything else you'd really like to mention? I know there is. I can see it on your face. Uh, This this has just been, uh, you know, I think we have to realize that a lot of our patients have been through, you know, this is my, this is just my story. This is, mm-hmm. I'm one of millions of people in the United States, billions, who have their own unique stories to tell. And and this sort of thing, this experience of the whole uh, coronavirus pandemic, everyone has a story to tell. So I encourage you to find a way to tell your story, mm-hmm. even if that means you write it down um, that you um, find a way to tell someone else, probably writing it down is the best way because all of us are sharing right. to each other. What is your virus pandemic 
experience been like? And that was what was probably the most generous thing that you've done in allowing me to tell this today yes. was this is my story. It's a, It's been a long journey. Lots of different things have happened. Um, and, and to the transitions that have happened in our business, um, nothing was was done without um, f- without thinking things through. Thank you for saying that because I have a feeling a lot of people think, well, you just did this and it inconvenienced me and you did it because you just wanted to do it. But I know that they're hurting too and of they've course. had a lot of losses in their yeah. lives. And so this is just one more loss that people are experiencing. So I understand that and, and I know it's painful. Um, it, it has been uh, definitely a challenge. It was challenging to me to present to a panel of physicians who were making a determination about my insurance contracts. I presented them with those 25 or 30 articles demonstrating mm-hmm. that I didn't need to get a vaccine. And, um, you know, I've demonstrated with my recovery from the vaccine, I mean, from the virus, that I am uh, not going to be a burden on society, that my health is intact. I'm back to the gym, of, of course. course. I'm heading there at 630 uh, mm-hmm. to see my trainer. And so um, so demonstrating that I'm not going to be a burden on society and showing that I have natural immunity by giving my giving them copies and even all of that, there was it was still there was still no recognition that natural immunity is a thing, and so there is um, it is a little bit a, a little nefarious. There's something, you know. I think you're very kind and euphemistic. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you have somebody who mandates that everyone is basically going to get vaccinated, I think that's a little scary. Well, what I think was really interesting was they didn't mandate that my entire practice be vaccinated. They only mandated that I be vaccinated. And their they they their reason was because they they said you um, we we don't want to spread this to the community and I said but you're only mandating me and not my practice mm. so how does one interpret that I, yeah. and I have a feeling Suzanne that over time your staff will be next well and we're seeing what's happening with the um, overturn of a lot of the cases so I'm I'm hoping that that will make some changes going forward Suzanne a couple quick questions before we're done here in in uh, four minutes. One is, uh, we were asked by one of the engineers, what is a cytokine storm? What are you oh, guys talking about? Yes. So when your body goes fights off a virus, some of the things it does is create cytokines, which are signaling molecules. They tell your cells that there's something bad going on. There's something to be scared of. So they start to change the way your DNA is expressed. Your cells turn down their production of normal daily proteins and and begin to become a, uh, I think Dr. McCullough called it a battleship. They yeah. begin to become a, a virus fighting community. So instead of doing your daily eyeball, looking at the light and tongue tasting food and, you know, heart muscle cells contracting to keep the heart beating. Now everyone turns their faces because of these cytokines, these chemical messengers that the cells begin to produce when they see this virus. Now your body begins to create create this whole storm because everyone's trying to fight the virus, which is why you feel so tired because your normal functions Mm -hmm. are being ignored in favor of going for this thing. The problem with the people who get very sick from COVID is they've actually fought off the virus. And now this cytokine storm, this chemical messenger doesn't stop even though the virus is gone. So that's what the cytokine storm is. Thank you for that question and for for, um, being brave enough to ask. Thank you for being on my show today, Suzanne. It's Mm -hmm. always such a privilege to have you and and you're so wise and you have such great experience and great stories to share. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Folks, I am Dr. Nelson Bullmesh. You have just listened to the last show of Health Matters in the year 2021. It has been a privilege and an honor to present the amazing guests that I have to you. I will continue next year and I will be here in two weeks. Anybody have a calendar handy and know that exact date? Let's have one of my astute engineers here. Which date? It is January 4th. I will be back at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you again, and please like and share my show. I appreciate all of you. Remember, always be your best. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Health Matters with Dr. Nelson Bullmash, where we help you discover how to ignite your mind, body, and spirit connection. Join us next time when we will bring you more exciting guests and engaging topics. Meanwhile, 
Feed your mind, exercise your body, and nurture your spirit. The United Intentions Foundation and its associates take no responsibility for the opinions and statements made by the talk show hosts 